Oh. Yo, it's freezing. <laughs> hello, hello, oh. hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome uh, for people joining us on Facebook, people joining us on YouTube, and people joining us on Twitter. Welcome to another virtual, virtual event of the Cheeky Natives. I think like we say this a lot, but I, I'm grateful for the pandemic in this sense that we've been able to find community across oceans, right? And mm -hmm. the internet for all its badness has given us this one thing where we can connect in real time with each other. Um, and ah. today it's really exciting. Um, I think it's really, really exciting because um, Alma and I really love short stories. I know Alma mm. um, constantly sends me, oh my gosh, have you read this short story? Have you read this short story? <laughs> and so like, we also follow the Kane Price, the um, Uncle Kane Price quite closely. And look, today we have two guests uh, who are shortlisted for the Kane Price for 2021. Um, so so that's what we'll be doing today. Alma, how are you doing? Look, I, I'm, a, I'm okay. I'm alive. Uh, I think that this has been a, a week of a lot of unrest in South Africa, uh, particularly where we are based, Little Honol in Johannesburg, and, and of course in KZN as well. So we're just grateful to be alive in one piece. Um, and of course, in the pandemic, you're just grateful for your health as well. So that's where I am. That is my very Yanla Vanzant. Um, fixing my life answer. But I'm also super excited for today's conversation. I mean, we're in conversation with two two authors whose stories I, I particularly enjoyed. Uh, and of course, we're quite privileged to, to be discussing short stories. I think people don't realize how hard it is to write a short story. And I'm sure in our conversation today, um, both Doreen Bangana and Irene Tushabe are going to tell us just how how challenging it's been to just capture your audience in in ten pages or less, which is absolutely brilliant. So welcome to both of you to to the Cheeky Natives and congratulations on being shortlisted. That is a phenomenal achievement. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. I suppose Doreen and um, to start, the, the, the first question I want to ask both of you is this, right? Um, why the short story as, an, as a form, right? Why not write a whole entire novel? Because, you know, I'm just saying the stories that I read could be in a novel. I, I want to know the background. I want to know everything, what happens after, before, during. Uh, why short stories? Um, why the short story form? Uh, why is it important to you? We can start with you, Doreen. Uh, thanks for having me, and and uh, that's a very, very good question. I actually love the short story form. I've been writing short stories for over two decades, but this one was actually an extract from a novel I've been working on for a very long time. It's a chapter of the novel, and I realized it could stand alone, so I took it out and then I worked on it some more to make it a cohesive unit as a short story. I think a, a, thought, a short story is, um, it's got a lot of impact, you know, short and sweet. In a really uh, short time, you can have the heft and the impact and the resonance that a novel has. And uh, the artistry of it is always um, interesting for me as a writer. So it came out of a, it came out of a novel I've been working on. Oh, look at that! Look at look at look at you us at empty novels happening. Um, and <laughs> what about you, Irene? <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about short stories. As a reader, I love short stories, and uh, especially now that I'm writing a novel, it's uh, always nice to pick up a short story that you can read and finish and then move on with your day, but have that sense of, of completion, you know, have the whole universe of the story in your head. As a writer, I find that there are stories that lend themselves well to the short form, whereas there are others that, you know, demand to keep giving more and more. This particular one, A Separation, came to me as a short story. And yes, I think perhaps there's enough of it not to, to make it into a novel. But I did feel um, I was learning actually to, it was my um, launch, pa launch pad into fiction. So I experimented a lot with it. And I wanted to learn how to tell stories in this short form. So 
I wanted it to be a short story, so it is a short story. It was my intention. <laughs> I, I guess just adding on to, to that layer is for me questions around craft and the technicality. So what, what do short stories require in terms of craft and technicality that you think is quite different to other forms of, of long form of long form writing? Because like I said, I think a lot of people think, ah, oh, it's a short story, oh, this is so easy. But I think that the technicality behind the short story is actually quite demanding in ways that maybe a longer form of writing may not. Wow, well, that's a that's a whole writing course that you're asking <laughs> in, in uh, <laughs> three minutes. Short stories, <laughs> but um, short dummies in in two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> a quick answer would be: um, novels usually have very many plots. You know, they tend to deal with more characters, and they've got you know plots that come in and and out and are sort of entwined. Short stories, generally speaking, although there are no rules, uh, have one main plot. Another thing I found with short stories is that you've got to draw your characters and make them whole and complete in a very short time. So every single word has to count. You don't have as wide a, cam a canvas, you know, to create character and, you know, have all that character development. So you've just got to start off you know, strong and, you know, hit all the notes without, uh, very quickly. And um, what else? Irene, do you have any other ideas about the short story? I just wanted to echo what you said, because with a short story, every word, every sentence has to earn its place on the page. During the rewrite, you can't be precious about that really nice line you worked on for weeks to perfect. It has to, if it has to go, it has to go. If it's not serving, uh, the forward momentum of the story, it's got to go. I mean, I think what's important is to jump right into the short stories that um, Alma and I read with great, great interest. Um, mm. I, I have to say, um, both your stories, like Stole My Heart, um, mm. I, I read them quite late one night where I was like, okay, I need to start and I need to read this. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like, hold up, like, it's finished? Like, that's the end of it? I want to know more. Like, I want to know more. Um, so I want to, I, I suppose I want to ask both of you this question, right? Um, so Doreen, your short story's title is Lucky. And I'm interested in the title, particularly because of, 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 of what happens in the story and sort of the type of, 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 of tragedy that takes place in the story. Um, I, I want to know that. And I mean, just to come to you and think about like also your title uh, on separation, to think about like how you use the title to sort of speak about a number of moving parts, right? Because there's a, a separation is used as, as, a, as a literal separation, but also a metaphor in certain instances. And I wanted to ask both of you, why the title, why that title and not something else? Who 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 do you, who would you like to go first? Dorian, you can go first. Okay, I'm the lucky one. Titles are always tricky. They're always tricky. You wonder whether to pick a line from the story or, and I just thought there's always. I I wanted also to talk about sort of the dialogue between different generations, especially teachers and students, older people who think they know it all, and younger people who know they know it all. So. These young boys are just, though, especially the, the main character, are just sick and tired of the teachers who feel, you know, keep telling them things. You know, you can imagine someone beating you and tells you, this is good for you. You know, I'm <laughs> that's the kind of thing that, uh, you know, all the people tend to say. So in this case, the teacher says, you're lucky to be stuck here. And it's quite obvious that they are not. So it's just ironic. But interestingly enough, someone who read the story afterwards, told me that in that in uh, northern Uganda, after the war that I was writing about, they had a decade of um, Joseph Kony and a lot of civil strife. And people would tell, would say when someone has died, that person is lucky to have died and not seen these other atrocities. So I didn't know that when I wrote the story, but that idea that you're actually lucky to be dead is 
quite shocking. Wow, that's 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 powerful, Doreen. Um, I thought, you know, I just thought it's ironic. It's an ironic title. You read and think, oh, lucky, but you know, they're not lucky. But here you learn that they are lucky because they're people facing harder hardships than they are. For myself, for my own story, a separation, like you said, it does work on multiple levels throughout the story. And I wondered if I could just read a tiny paragraph for you and then I can explain it afterwards. Please, by all means, read, 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 read. Okay, so this is from uh, this is from somewhere in the middle of the story. But uh, Harriet uh, is spending her last evening with her grandmother before she, Harriet, moves to Canada to study at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. So this is a moment that they shared together, and they're talking about. She's talking about her mother, Harriet's own mother, who died, and then after she died, that's when her grandmother came to live with them to raise her, and she says. Here, Harriet, I was eight years old when my mother succumbed to the poison of a black mamba. That's when Kaka came to live with me, with, with father and me. Grandfather had left her years before to go live with a much younger woman. On the day of my mother's funeral, Kaka told me that Nyavinji, the rain goddess our tribe worships, had called mother into the spirit world. She wanted me to understand that my mother still lived on. Only now her physical presence was lost to us. I didn't tell her that her explanation was cruel, that it only made it harder for me to grieve for my mother. Tell me again how she died, I said. I say, willing myself to accept her view of death, that it births one into a form of oneself bigger than life and visible only to the living whose eyes have grown eyes. So that is a, that, I think that's more the level of separation I was talking about, about how People can be gone from us, but also really stay with us in um, a different, but also meaningful way through how they, you know, um, touched us. But also through this kind of mythology that is part of this story where this universe, uh, this universe where this story uh, lives, is that really in a real sense, the grandmother believes that the death, the, the dead is just a physical removal, the physical is gone, but the spiritual does stay. So that is a separation that I kind of referenced, but also of course there's that degree of removal, the fact that she's in Canada and uh, and her grandmother is still back home. I I love it and I think it's so great that you actually read from from your from your story, Irene, because I think that it, it provides us a great platform for us to actually just speak a little bit more about about your story. And I I'm interested in conceptualizations around grief, um, particularly in this instance, right? Because I think of the ways in which you've used grief as a vehicle to remember. So, so much of Harriet's remembering is in the grieving, right? But what does it mean to have so many of your memories actually imbued in loss? So, so much of what you remember about the person is characterized by their loss. And what does that mean for the character in your story? I think, yeah, I think that um, grief does shape you. And I think that's why, I think it's why I like to situate my characters during a period of their lives when they're most vulnerable. Because I think during such, such times, they can make surprising choices and decisions they usually wouldn't make if, you know, if Harriet's grandmother hadn't died. I don't think she would be gazing down with that lens upon the moments they last, the moments they last shared together with that heaviness. I, she, on that night when she left Uganda, she probably wasn't thinking this is the last and she wasn't fixating on every little gesture, every word her grandmother said, you know, trying to, to imbue, to, to, to bring a lot of herself, of her grandmother with her to Canada. It would just been, a, you know, it would been sad, but it would been a, a regular parting. But with this news that her grandmother has died, then the heaviness just does settle and she, looks back differently than she would have if her grandmother was still alive. So, yeah, so I do think that grief heightens, um, is the main, um, it does heighten uh, the feelings and the emotions and everything that happens, it kind of is the driver of the story. And yesterday, actually, some, Doreen said something really important about how our history and the things that are a part of us are, make a place for us in the world. So these 
everything, every, everything she's shared with her grandmother, when she brings it to, with her to Canada, she's able to form kind of a home for herself that she can inhabit with herself and the memory of her grandmother. I really like that in many ways we could see separation as a reading companion to Lucky, just because of like how polar opposites in many instances it can be, right? And this question of grief made me think about Lucky and and sort of the the pivoting of masculinity that you bring forth in the in the story, Doreen, about like how in many instances, sort of the last scene of 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 the main protagonist taking the blanket and and going to the teacher, um, sort of allows us because the whole story is not intimate, but there's this intimate moment that I think grief allows us to enter into, no matter who we are, right? And I wanted to speak a little more about that the idea of like masculinity and the ways in which like masculine presenting, particularly cisgendered, heterosexual men have been told to not feel emotions and how you are able to subtly like sort of debunk that in a story that's filled with such rife masculinity. Yeah, that's a, that's a, you, you all keep asking these uh, essay like questions, but <laughs> That's a, a big, big, a big, a huge question. I was trying to, when I was writing the story, the first draft, I didn't know where it was going to go. And then when, when the teacher got shot, I was, I was thinking, how, how, how is this boy going to react? And you know, grieving, grieving is something we do in community, right? Grieving is something we do as a ritual. And this is a young boy who has not been taught yet how to grieve. And so he has to create his own rituals. He has to create his own rituals. And so he feels like, okay, let me, I don't even think he thinks it through. There are some things you just do. And, and perhaps he is young enough that he has not yet been taught fully, don't show your emotions, don't cry, don't, you know, to be a man, don't, you know, do this and that. Even as, you know, the way Koma walked out of the door, he was like, um, the guy, you know, and then just before he gets shot. So he was actually being, I don't know what they call, you know, enacting masculinity at that point. And um, it was interesting for me being uh, a woman, or I, I think I am, to have to sort of get into the brain of my male characters, knowing that they aren't that different from me, but at the same time, uh, they have, uh, I guess they've absorb, absorbed cultural ways of, of, you know, enacting their agenda. So I had, comma, had one way. But I imagine um, if that boy had been a girl, he might have still done the same thing with the blanket. I think he still might have done the same thing. I think these really acute moments, we even forget what we are taught and how we are taught to behave and we just are human in our reactions. And I, I, I think that's what happened, but I wasn't really thinking, how is he going to grieve as a male? I just thought, how can I write on the page? Someone doesn't know how to do it, mm. how to do it. Does it make sense? I, it does. It does. And, I, and I think that yeah. for me, it, it then makes me think of, of, you know, when you've spoken about grief and how we grieve as being communal, right? And how conceptualizations of grief are also communal and mourning. I think of in a separation, right? How, Irene, you highlight African conceptualizations of death, right? That dispel the idea of solitude. So that, that death is, is not this final breaking of, of the, the relationship, right? Um, and you think of the relationship between Harriet's mother and her grandmother and the ways in which they continue to have a relationship outside of the realm of the physical. And I, I want to know why it was important for you, Irene, to highlight that conceptualization of death, particularly now, right? I think that with COVID and with so much of the loss and grief that people do, 
that people are experiencing we're having conversations around grief and death and passing and there's a very specific thing that you do around our conceptualization of death and loss and what that means for the physical and the spiritual so if you could just talk to why you wanted to highlight that particularly in that vision i think also just to um add on to to your question alma i think irene also your story as doreen may have mentioned there's also this element of grieving as ritual so in 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 as much as there is the the debunking the physicality of death there's also this idea of how we can commune with the dead as mourning but also a celebration right and i also want you to speak a little bit about that because i think about like the the tea as a key point of when the grandmother passes away um ganesh makes the tea and the aroma sort of gives us a moment of the the physicality doesn't matter although this person has passed away they're still present right um uh... I would just start by saying that the story was actually inspired by an actual event. My grandmother, um, who um, we weren't as close as Harriet and, and her grandmother were, but I actually rediscovered a connection with her after I had my first child and went back home to Uganda and uh, to, just to take her to so she could see her, my her great grandmother. And um, that was uh, so. Two years later, after I'd come back, um, she passed away. And I was in university at the time. I couldn't afford to go back home just for the funeral. And so it's what, you know, Doreen has been talking about, about how the sort of mourning rituals and the last funeral rites, how those kind of help you gradually to accept that your beloved, you know, is gone from the world and you are surrounded by people who know her. And it's just, just it's a, when you're removed from that, when I'm grieving for my grandmother, when I'm in Canada and everyone else is doing, performing, you know, these last funeral rites in Uganda and I'm not there, there's this sense of closure that I do not get. But when my sister did tell me, texted me via text message that she had passed away, I sat back on the bed and it was, it was just a, after my husband had cried with me and left the room, it was just me in the room and I felt like a hand on my shoulder. And I'm, um, I'm truly, truly like Harriet. I believe in logical and quantifiable explanations of the world. So I'm not one to believe that um, you know, the, the dead can reach out from, you know, beyond the veil of death and touch us physically. But I did feel that hand and it lasted enough for me, you know, for it to become the seed for this story. And I grew up um, in Uganda, in rural Uganda, where we had no electricity or television. So entertainment was a migane, which is, you know, stories that we tell each other. And they're stories that are very old, passed down generations. So my father would have heard this story from perhaps his grandmother, and, and they get embellished, of course, you know, people add their own details as time goes by. But Nyavinji was, a, was a, a sort of deity who had many cameos in very many Amigane. And she's the sort of um, goddess who, you know, would take on, for example, the form of an old woman or a beggar and would come to your door and to ask for food and water, you know, and if you turned her away, curses and evil might befall your household. But if you treated her nicely, gave her food, gave her water, cleaned her up, and then suddenly you're living with bounty. So her name, Nyavinji, for me, means um, uh, the goddess of plenty because Vinji means many in, in Ruchiga. So she is someone that through storytelling is it's just always close to me somehow. And um, again, I think moving away from home kind of fills you with that longing for home. So whenever I'm thinking about the beautiful things that home means, she's one of those things because she was very present in the stories that I told and that I was told. And, and um, I think, Perhaps, you know, that's how she came to me for, for, for this. And I, I don't know, after colonialism, she got a, kind of wiped away. I don't think there's many Machiga who still, who even like maybe even have ever heard of her because Uganda is so modern now and um, entertainment comes from television and perhaps there's not as many folk tales and folklore going around. And of course, it's largely Christian too at the moment, but I am... Um, 
I just really love the notion of of having this goddess, this deity, and her pantheon of deities persist into. I think she deserves her place in history. She was quite popular before colonialism, before she got wiped out, and before the you know uh, the missionaries told us that she that's savagery and that's um, backward, and we should adopt the god of heaven. <laughs> Um, I also like that um, another way in which Lucky sits, you know, quite closely to um, separation is, you know, in separation we deal with with displacement as sort of uh, far away, but in Lucky I think we we deal with displacement in a different context, right? So there's this idea of these people who've been left behind, mm -hmm. and I wanted to 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 for for you, Doreen, to just you know. Um, just talk us through that, right? There's this idea of these people who are separated from their king and, and, and left behind and what that looks like for them in terms of holding community and be able to get through this war. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I hadn't seen the connections with the, uh, Irene's story where she where the character did the leaving, but in a sense, her kaka left her behind. On, left her on earth and yeah you know be having this really christian background i don't know if it happened with you guys where you get so scared about the rapture and you're going to get left behind and the good people will go to heaven <laughs> it's been like my biggest scare when i was small even now sometimes i wonder you know like what if everybody's gone but i hope i'm not that bad so that idea I think has always been there that, um, you know, being left out, being left behind, not being one of the chosen ones. And so this boy, this boy, this group of boys uh, were left behind at school physically. That also, um, a friend of mine told me, I think I did I just say it, got left behind at school during the war and that sparked uh, the story because he said the Laquena army ran through the school. But I think it also means, I also see it as a generation being left behind because when I think about these, uh, these boys and what they went through, they didn't know because this is the war that was 1987-86-87 by Alice Laquena just before the decade and a half of Joseph Kony who, uh, yeah, a decade and a half of civil war in Northern Uganda, where, which led to a whole region being left behind economically and socially, while the Southern part of Uganda continued on with its, you know, development race or whatever. And uh, in fact, many, many people in the South got rich from that war because there were soldiers who were stealing all the army money and all that. So there's a region that was left behind. There's a generation left behind because, um, you know, in a, in a period of, of, of luck and strife, you, you don't have the childhood you're supposed to have. These kids at that point in the story, childhood, you, when you've witnessed that your childhood is over, you're 13 and 14, you can't, you, you, you're just, I guess it's not really, it would be being pushed into adulthood, which doesn't really sound like left behind, but there's something missing in there. But I was just thinking about also, also, um, also, uh, Koma has gone and left them behind. You know, Koma, the teacher has gone, who was supposed to be with them at school, has gone, has passed on, joined the ancestors or whatever, and they are still left behind to deal with it as boys on their own. I, I'm so glad you're talking about Koma because I have so many feelings, Green, about the ways in which Koma's story ended. I'm sure that that's a sentiment that's been echoed by quite a few people. And I was challenged by the ways in which Koma's story ended, right? Because in many ways, Koma is the is the character who chooses to remain behind, right? So, well, 
well, it's alluded to in the story that he may not have been able to leave, right? He may not have had somewhere to go, but I'd like to believe that he chose to remain behind at a time when all the other teachers left these children behind. But then as you read the story, he becomes the first clear casualty of this conflict, right? And there is just a con there is just something so telling about the ways in which this man, who in many ways has chosen to stay and remain, then becomes the first casualty that these boys witness. And I, I want to know what what was the the, the thinking behind that particular ending for teacher coma, but also what what message was being conveyed in in that particular ending for him. Well, to be honest, uh, oh, well, I'm always honest, but while I was writing the story, I wasn't really thinking through the meanings of the different, of, you know, coma being the one to die, or um, it, uh, it only began to resonate after I had written it. And I was like, oh, okay, so this seems to work this way. Sometimes the story just comes and you write it. And uh, then afterwards, you try to make sense of it. I mean, the fact that he was the only adult and was trying to act adult. And so he stood up and went to the door. Uh, uh, I think um, was almost uh, sacrificial in a way. But also, I really wanted to show throughout about this whole thing of... of um, that the know it allness of adults, adults thinking they should set the example, they should talk like they know everything, at least especially from the point of view of a 13 year old or a 14 year old. And most of the time they're just uh, bullshitting their way through life. Sorry, I don't know if your program accepts that kind of language. These teachers are in their 20s or <laughs> 30s and they are acting adulthood. And when they are not, so, so I wanted to show that I think that adults are playing at adulthood, playing around with their lives with real consequences. And these boys can see it because they knew I actually had meant for him to, to have been lying when he said he chose to stay. He actually was stuck as well, but he wants to present this example of being the strong male teacher who's going to teach to keep the kids. And so, so there's that, um, Again, maybe the performance of masculinity and, and what can go wrong when you're just performing something and you're not really that. I wanted to make him, I think, vulnerable in that way. An anti, anti-hero, I guess. Oh, I love I love that you've said that um, because I think oftentimes we expect people like Goma to be the hero, right? So to save everyone, but like it's war. Like um, at the end of the day, it's like, each to their own, right? And I'm trying to do this thing, but in truth, I'm just as scared as everybody else. And I, I think I adore that quality because people aren't good or bad. Like people are good and bad. Hopefully the good overshadows the bad. And I think, you know, he's that he, he it's a redeeming quality in the end when he's, you know, he sacrifices himself for the, for the children. And I think that's a, that's a really powerful moment. Yeah. Whatever his motivations were in the beginning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I mean, I wanted to say that I, one of the main reasons I resonated to your short story was because um, in 2017, I was doing a graduate program in the US and um, maybe my second month there, uh, my mom passed. Um, and, um, you know, I got the dreaded phone call and just, you know, my world kind of shattered. And when I was reading the story, I was thinking particularly of the moment when Harriet walks out into the rain, right, and just, like, gets lost. And thinking about, like, physical displacement and the ways in which we grieve, right? Because as you were talking about earlier on, you're talking about funeral rites and, 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 and sort of this, this form of closure. But what happens in instances where you're not close to people at the time that are able to hold you and be like, I'm, I can sit with you in this loss. 
And I can understand that I may not know this person that you've met, but I can sit with you. And what's interesting about Harriet is that even when she does get some form of human connection, there isn't really a moment where she says, I've lost this really important person in my life, right? It's like, and, and I was interested in that, in that like, because you're in this foreign land and because you're uncertain, how do you let people hold you or hold space for you when you're grieving? Right, because you can't tell someone you've just met, right? It's just like, actually, my grandmother died. That's how I got lost in the storm. Uh, you can't do that. It's as, a hum as, a, as an adult human being who knows how socializing works, you can't do that. But it's, 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 this, it's the thing about grief, how it makes you a stranger even to yourself. You don't know yourself. You don't know what you do. So that moment when Harriet just puts on, pulls on her sneakers and runs you know, into the storm and gets lost in the storm, as it were, um, that is something you can do when you're grieving. Probably not something you can do if you're, everything is perfectly fine with you. So yeah, I'm just, I'm really sorry to hear about your, your, your mom passing away that way. It's just, it's the hardest thing about, about leaving home, about moving away from home. It's because you don't know if the last time you see your people is, the la is actually the last that you'll never get to see them again. And so, yeah, it just really makes it hard. It just, um, it's incredibly difficult. And I have lost quite a few people that my brother died that way too. And I wasn't able to go because my uh, status in Canada was still in flux. So that if I left, I didn't know if I could come back. And it's not just me, I've got family here. So it just becomes a, a complicated amalgamation of so many, so many different things. And that heightens the grief, that makes the grief ever more. It blows it out of proportion because, I mean, a grandmother dying, in a way you expect it. They're not going to be here forever, right? It's a, you know somehow that a 90-year-old woman is, is, is going to die quite soon. Still, grief is it's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult beast to wrestle down. And I think, that's a, I think that's one thing that works with this story is when I felt that it had succeeded, that I had a draft that was quite finished, was when I decided to write all of it in the present tense mm. so that whatever what happens in Uganda and what happens in Canada are all in the present because she's experiencing them, all of them for the first time, even if what happened in Uganda was quite, you know, it was three weeks ago. Yeah, I, I, I am curious, right, because we've spoken about community, you know, and there's a community that forms, the community that forms, um, particularly in displacement. So when you are displaced and you are not from a particular area and you meet other people who are not from the area, there's a community that also forms, right? So I think of the ways in which Ganesh and Ganesh's grandmother treats Harriet, which allows the formation of a community and a little bit more than community, we hope, uh, as the story is revealed. Um, but I'm curious about the ways in which people form communities when they are displaced, right? Um, because you are then away from the culture and the, and, the, and, the, and the traditions and the ways in which your own community does things. And yet in this displacement, it seems that you're able to find a community in the way that Ganesh and Harriet form for each other. And I think it's also true, sorry, I think it's also true for your story, Doreen. I think that when the boys are left behind with the teacher, there's a sort of community that is created because we're all displaced and let us hang out together. So I suppose both reflections about the idea of like being left behind and marginality and displacement mm -hmm. as community. Yeah. And I mean, just yeah. To, to, to Doreen's story would be the relationship that the boys then form with Okoriro, right? Um, who in many ways they respect a little bit more than their teachers. Um, and if you think about his social status, I think in any other community that wasn't experiencing sort of the civil strife and the war that that community was experiencing, people may not have taken Okoriro seriously, right? Or, or, or seen him to be somebody to admire and look to. So there's a thing about the, the ways in which a commonality of struggle also adds humanity for people who otherwise would be deprived of it. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of depressing that it has to be strife or struggle that will that makes 
hopefully we could make communities of joy <laughs> and you know i guess there are dance communities and, and those exist as well you know and uh so it's very, very true. These, these, these guys, these boys who were abandoned did have to, and that's why I started the story with them foraging for food and talking about the, the, the dormitory and how they have to now all stay in one room. They're trying to create a, a home of sorts for themselves um, since they've been left behind. So, uh, you know, a forced community, just like the soldiers themselves are, are some sort of community, the two different um armies and is it just enough that going through a similar experience makes community i, I don't know i mean maybe they, i mean these guys have been these boys i imagine in their future because they've been scarred the same way uh will have something in common and, and that they will you know they will continue to hold them together and that's why i especially wanted them to to hide under the bunk and show the physicality of it they are really close together and sweating and pissing on each other and <laughs> everything you know too much community <laughs> at that point <laughs> but um yeah unfortunately there are communities of of mourning and communities of loss but i was i was curious that in irene your story you chose ganesh who is another immigrant i assume that she had to go find community with another immigrant was that Deliberate? I think so. Sorry, I, I okay. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I didn't intentionally want to find her to find another immigrant, but I don't know. It just in the in the moment of the story when she knocked on the door, this just happens to be the family there. But I'm sure in, at the back of my mind, I would have been thinking, who can she, who who can who can who who could really make a meaningful connection with her? It might have been you know a Canadian family, but it being a family of other immigrants just, I think, comforts her, you know, and, and lets her know that perhaps these are people who might understand her feelings of being uprooted and feeling displaced, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you had mentioned, sorry, I forgot the part you mentioned about Okiror, the old man. He's just back home in the, the narrator's village, so the other boys don't know him. So that was just in his past. And that was more sort of exploring the, the legacy of, of, of violence from generation to generation. For this old man, Muse means old man in, in um, Kiswahili. So it's just a title of respect. And it's, it's his identity was being a soldier. He would have to make up some of the wars that he was not actually in. But he was in all the wars in the history of, of, of um, Uganda or post-colonial history. And again, I was sort of investigating what does it mean? What, how do we carry violence on from generation to generation? And, and what happens when we idealize violence or we, 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 we make it okay? You know, as I've said you know, elsewhere, if you put on a uniform and you're a soldier, it's okay to kill. If you don't have the uniform, that's murder, you know? So was Koma murdered or killed? <laughs> was that a war situation? Well, he's a civilian. You're not supposed to kill civilians. Anyway, um, so, so I wanted him there to show that there, we have a problem where we idealize violence. And this is why it continues on from generation to generation. And most likely, this boy may become a soldier. It wouldn't be surprising. Mm -hmm. mm. It wouldn't be surprising, but I think that it would it would be sad, right? So I think that there's a lot of sadness there. And I think, Doreen, for yeah. you, because you've now touched upon this, I think of the multifaceted nature of war, right? And how it can then bring out complexity in how we view people. So you think of how you've spoken about how in the story, the so some of the soldiers were rebels, some of the rebels um, became soldiers, and there's this fluid situation that happens, right? And that also means that in, in our analysis, of the story, then we start to think about how war in itself can bring out a complexity in the nature of people, right? And there's a complexity that you explore there where nobody is all good, but nobody is also all bad. So how do we then decide in the complex nature of, of what war brings upon 
what that then says about the people who participate in war, be it soldiers, be it rebels, how do we then look at at, at them in their complexity outside of just saying they're, everyone who's a rebel is bad, everyone who's a soldier is good because we know that is particularly with soldiers, we've, we've seen that not all soldiers are good or humane or do the right thing. And I think also yeah. it's evidence in the story by sort of the, the rebel who says to them, stay inside, right? So like a hidden call of like, like for your own safety and for your own good, like stay inside. Don't try and be a hero. Don't try and be like uh, the teacher, just stay inside because like really this is conflict. So I, the, the complexity like sort of rests there and interested about your reflections on that. Yeah, because, um, you know, these soldiers that are just, are just young boys, young, young men who uh, you put on this clothing and you're given a gun, but these are people's uncles, brothers, you know, fathers. They're just they're just people. They're not they're not. Maybe they've been trained. They've been trained to kill, and but for many of them, you ask and you find that they're just doing their job. They're just doing their job, and so I wanted to find a way to humanize these people in uniform by by this this guy saying, you know, just stay inside, sort of trying to be protective of these boys to show that um, it could have been, Koma could have been the one in the uniform and the other way around. Perhaps he had the advantage of a particular education or, or being born, you know, somewhere it's just almost, you know, roll of the dice. But I always think war is very interesting to write about because it's a... Oh no, oh, no. Oh, no. Um, I think the network may have dropped. So yeah. let's just wait for her to come back. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, I think Irene, I'm, I really loved your story. I just want you to know, like, I, okay. I, I resonated so deeply with, with the story. I wanted to speak about, I think, like, often when we read stories like your stories, we, we, we kind of um, leave away thinking, oh, it's just a story about grief and it's just the story of heaviness. But yeah. it isn't just about heaviness, right? There are like really tender moments in the story. And I think some of my favorite moments includes Harriet being with her grandmother and just sitting and having tea and 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 also like creating ritual, right? To creating mm -hmm. um, like sort of community. This is something that only you and I could do. And, and what I really particularly liked was this moment when um, she gave her the... Um, the 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 necklace the curry yes, shell necklace yeah. yes you were curry shells um to her um effectively to say to and you know Harriet says oh my gosh babes have you also given up on me getting married and she's yeah. like no, I want you to know that you're not defined by marriage and yeah. sort of like a little feminist leaning and feminist work there right about like the grandmother saying perhaps in many instances I did not have the choices that you have now but I want you to know even when you make those choices that you are enough. And that moment sort of signified that for me. And I wanted you to reflect a little bit about that, right? Just this, um, these women having a tender moment across generation, but also a breaking sort of a, a generational ritual and be like, you don't have to get married in order to earn this necklace. Yeah, for sure. It's something that's always bothered me. Um, even before I started to call myself a feminist, the way that when you, you know, finish, go through school, finish secondary school, you finish university, and it's not, oh, have you got a job yet? It's just, have you got a husband? You, you have, what are your marriage prospects? <laughs> so, um, and, and, and it's something that I'd always discuss, because I never sort of got married in the traditional sense of getting married. So whenever people would say, well, when are you, I was like, oh, I already am, I've got kids, what do you want? <laughs> or if you get married and then two years into it and you still you don't have kids and people just where are they where are they as if that is the point of getting married is to have kids so I am um, you know I think many people who have that sort of thinking in the in the African sense you wouldn't call them feminist in the but they are like that's that's this as applied to our culture um like we don't have manifestos or, or anything, but we do have people who 
have this kind of thinking, even though it's not what you popularly hear um, that, you know, but, uh, and I think my grandmother was this sort of a woman. So that is something that I borrowed for sure uh, to bring into mm -hmm. the story. That was a part of her, that she, she had, uh, um, she too had adopted Christianity. she no longer actually believed in Nyabinji. That is something that uh, my dad had, um, the belief in Yabinji. And it's not, like, not intense, but telling stories of nostalgically about that sort of a time period. Yeah, and um, I think, too, in my writing, I always want to, when you're writing from a place of nostalgia, these are the things that you remember that stay with you, the food, the tea that you share, for example, and the smiles and the things that are particular to the person that make them live on no matter how long they've been dead, so that when you think about them, you can, you can, you can, it, the feeling is so visceral, you can smell the lemongrass. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, yeah. <laughs> to Irene, I, I, I Sorry? Oh, I was just going to say you had a very, we had a very uh, progressive grandmother. My grandmother, when I wore shorts, would, would say, oh, now you're a boy. Shorts. <laughs> so, yeah. Lucky <laughs> you. <laughs> no, still, up to now, their relatives, I can't visit if I'm wearing jeans. Or, or I have to, if, I, if it's all I have, I have to put a lasso over it. And, you know, you yeah. respect them because you love them. I guess they're a product, and we're all products of our upbringing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I want to talk, talk about names, I mean, because I, names in this story are interesting, right? Um, I guess, so I think of how Harriet is named after her grandmother, and Ganesh in the story appears twice. So they have an initial encounter with somebody named Ganesh who comes to stay in the, in the, in the, in their sanctuary, and, uh, and then Harriet's Bay, Touchwood, I hope that in the story, you know, one day he, he becomes her bay. And, and so there's, there's, there's a thing that you do with the names of these people, which I guess almost looks like a predestination, right? So the way that love appears in this book looks like um, like a predestination because it almost seems as though it is a return of something familiar, be it in the form of the name of, of the matriarch who raises you uh, when your mother passes or in this this in the love interest being somebody who shares a name with somebody who was once on the sanctuary. So it feels in many ways that there's a familiarity that you, that you frame the love in, in the story with. And I, and I, I'm, I'm interested about that because I mean, we've spoken about the familiarity of death and of mourning and of grief, but there's also familiarity of love and, and acquaintance and companionship that I think you frame so beautifully in the story. For sure. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I grew up in a tourist village. It's called Bigodi and it's right up against uh, Chibale Forest in Western Uganda. So it's a tourist town and it's a little idyllic. It's very rural, but also really beautiful. And that forest has the biggest population of, um, of chimpanzees in East Africa, in Af probably in all the world. So you have uh, researchers from all over the world, they come to conduct research in that forest. So there's a lot of interaction with the, between tourists and the locals. So I think it was easy for me to imagine that someone like a writer from India or wherever might have come and spent time at the cabin that was part of the sanctuary which, uh, uh, where Harriet lived and sort of like a writing residency. And I, it, it was an image then that returns um, and I thought perhaps because Kaka is a little prophetic in some ways, I think it's this connection she has with Nyavinji that she might have been able to anticipate because when Harriet shows her the acceptance to the university and she says, she says, I'll come back. And she, she, no, she says, you will, you will learn so much in Canada, you'll acquire a lot of wisdom. So she drops hints as if she has ideas about her life is going to turn out as if she's kind of peered into the future and knows that Harriet is going to have a better time in Canada than she uh, she's, she knows. And so I think perhaps that with the touch on oh, 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 no, reaching, you know, with the touch on her oh, shoulder, um, that also that's a comforting hand to be, to remind her, you know, what did I tell you? You will acquire so much, you'll acquire so much wisdom. And here, now this is this is this person in your life that she might think perhaps that, 
it is predestined and maybe it is or maybe it's not um but it's one reading of the story and that i find you know acceptable <laughs> I love that though because it's so connected with with uh, with the Migani with the Migani the stories you are talking about that are always laced with with those connections between the people in this world and the people in the hereafter and a story being predestined because you know if a story is fiction and you're writing it you may already know what's going to happen so in a way the story is predestined <laughs> Because it's in your head before it's on the page, before it's happening to the characters. But I do love that sort of uh, the way you have included the stories you've been listening to as a child, the flavor of that uh, in this story that is very much sort of a realism in the realism mode, but you haven't lost those flavors of predestination. And, and I just like the fact that even us as storytellers, it's almost, if we know what we're going to say, we, are, we have predestined the characters, which is in proper English. But um, we're like gods. <laughs> in a yes. way. Thank you, Doreen, yes. Um, <laughs> so I see that other people who are watching us. Um, if you have any questions for our guests, please can you pop them and then we'll ask our guests these questions because obviously we could speak all night, but we also want to give you an opportunity <laughs> talk about how st these stories may have resonated. I'm going to ask both of you a very unfair question. Um, and the unfair question is, let's say you didn't write Lucky and you didn't write Separation. Um, what story of the five shortlisted do you wish you had written? After being shortlisted? Yes. I don't know. I don't know. I read. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's the, it's the reason that I have not allowed myself to think about what happens on the day of the announcement because all of these you stories know? are just so wonderful. And I would hate to be the judge. I hate to be the one who decides who wins this prize because reading the stories, they're all uh, unique. Uh, Troy's in Troy's story is so striking about this uh, um, man who is handicapped and the challenges that he gets to face, the dating challenges that he gets to face because uh, because of his uh, disability. And that's not something you see often in, in stories, disability. It's not portrayed with the same humanity, kindness, and realism that Troy brings to it. And then you've got... Um, Remy's story, <laughs> which is reading it, it's just like mental gymnastics. Uh, you know, it's a, it's very intricate and it's huge and in small, it, it, packed in a small world in a, in a space of you know a few pages. It's 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 an exemplification, of course, of of how a, sto a short story can hold so much. And then Maren's story, which you know, talk about um, white savior mentalities and how in the end this person learns that he too can play this game he just he's learned from the best right it's wonderful all this and doreen's story i wish i'd written doreen's story you know i really <laughs> wish i had because i feel like growing up um i heard about the holy spirit movement la quena who is who um doreen is writing about but then whether because she's a woman or because her her movement didn't last as long as Connie's. All you ever hear about is Connie, right? Everybody knows Connie. Nobody hears about La Quena. And I don't care if her methods were bad or also led to death, but she deserves her place in history too. Connie did a whole lot of harm, but he's all, all we hear about. So for sure, I mean, I am interested. And I'm interested in, in, you know, in Northern Uganda too. I'm, the novel I'm writing has a character who is from there. I think that I've read a lot because I'm a big fan of Okot Bitek and I've read a lot about that particular region and the culture of that region. So yes, I think I wish I'd written Doreen's story. I actually have a story called Lucky Baboon and there's a kid in it. I was so surprised to see that she has a story called Lucky too. Lucky Baboon? <laughs> Lucky Baboon, yes. <laughs> I'll send it to you, Doreen. <laughs> what about you, Doreen? What about you? <laughs> well, 
like like Erin has said, all the stories are intriguing. All the stories are so different. I think this Remy's story has many similarities with mine in that it's set in a school. Yeah. And and it's also about these young boys. He about boys, boys and girls in a school. So teenage sort of situation. His is not war, it's just sort of a uh, school school as a sort of a microcosm of 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 a world. And um I just loved that. I just felt that his his teenager, I think they are older than mine, are much more uh are much more witty and much more savvy and much more voracious and much more, more, more in many different ways. I mean it's a whole different setting and different class as well. So you know, but I like mine too. <laughs> Dare I say that? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think once you get nominated, you're like, oh, oh, so the story is good. You know, <laughs> yeah. So there seems to be a question from someone on YouTube for both so of us. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so for both guys, um, what are you currently working on? How does it feel to be nominated? Also, congratulations. I'm Ugandan, and it's so inspiring to see two Ugandan female writers nominated. Hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Marjorie. And uh, it's wonderful always to be in communication, even though I can't see you with someone who's from Uganda and interested in Ugandan literature. I, I, think, I think that perhaps now we'll begin to see more stories from Uganda because we've received this boost of confidence, Doreen, haven't we? And Doreen already has stories yeah. out. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just honored to, yesterday I got to be, to speak with Doreen and Jennifer, Nansubuga Makumbi. I don't know if you know her book, Chintu. Her books, her books, yeah. we love her books. Yes. <laughs> her books, and so for yeah. me, for me, that has been the greatest achievement of being on this shortlist is to, to get that visibility in Uganda as a Ugandan writer who lives in Canada. I'm, I mean, I'm here in the diaspora, but every story, sh fiction story that I've written so far is about home. And it's, it means a lot to have these stories being accessible to people um, from home. Yeah. I, I agree. I think if it had not been for the Kane Prize, we, we would have got to know about you, Irene, very soon. But now we know about you. Yeah. So that's great. Um, this is my third time being nominated. So, but I was nominated as the third, third time is the charm, Doreen. What? Third time is I the hope charm. So. <laughs> Fingers and toes crossed, but who knows? The last time I was put next to, at the award ceremony, I was put next to Ben Okri. So I said, I, I should, I think I've won. Why have they sat me next to Ben Okri? But <laughs> anyway, uh, what was Marjorie's question? <laughs> um, what are you working on and how does it feel to be nominated? <laughs> oh, okay. It feels good. It's affirming. It's affirming. I've been writing for a long time. And after a while, you every new project, you're almost, you're starting again. And you have to ask yourself, can I still do it? Was the, the last one, uh, uh, what's this word? Where you do something by accident and you just get it done. Was it a fluke? Do I still have it? And so it's affirming. I've been working on a novel. Like I said, this is an ex extract of, and I want to send it out this month. I've worked on it for way too long. And um, so that's what I'm working on now. I'm, I'm finishing that up. And I hope this, this even being nominated will help, you know, push publicity for that project. Oh, it's been such a wonderful, wonderful time with mm. both of you. Um, yeah. As you can tell, we both obviously loved your story so much. And uh, we can't wait um, to see who comes out as the Ken Prize winner for 2021. Um, but I also think that even though, um, like there can only be one winner, you know, as they say, even though there are, um, even though there will be one winner, it gives us an opportunity to get to know the writers and, and to sort of follow their work. I see there's another question here. 
Um, as writers of as writers of Ugandan history, do you think only good people, also known as popular heroes, should be remembered and celebrated? I think Irene touched on this a little bit earlier. Yeah, but that's the question for both of you. No, I think we need to remember everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, because, because it's part of who we are. Like Doreen said, it's the, this, this trauma that she describes in her book, in her story, which is part of a book, is intergenerational. It's been brought down uh, through time. And if we, if we forget that, we continue to perpetuate the, the past. And it depends on what story you are writing, really, because if you're writing a historical figure, they still have to be believable as people. You can't just represent the good side of them. Then they're just flat. They're caricatures of themselves. And that's a disservice. It's the job of a writer to be honest and uh, to, to speak the truth, no matter how bad or ugly. It's just, you know, how, how you portray it is then what is the moral of the story. I agree. I agree. There really shouldn't be shoulds. I think we yeah. have not enough of our stories have been told. There are so many untold stories that still need to be written. So, so you don't need to, no need to start monitoring, you know, should I tell this story? Should I not tell this story? Tell it all. Yeah. Tell it all. And history will be the judge if your, if your book, you know, stands the test of time or not. So, so don't really worry about, about whether someone's good or bad. A really good character would be boring yeah. to read. Yeah. But I wanted to say one thing. It seemed like you were so, uh, wrapping up a little bit. Can I just yes, say please. one small South African thing? Please. So, you know, at the end, there are all these uh, flies on the, on, on that, that were on the, on Koma, uh, who, yes. who is, was dead, yeah. And I always remember a joke when I was writing that. I was remembering a joke, uh, Trevor by Trevor Noah about about seeing all these poor people on TV. You know the one I'm talking about. And he's like, yes. there are all these poor people, and da, da, da. and he's like, why can't they just go like this? <laughs> you know, they have flies in their eyes, and <laughs> it's like they can't even. And his question is, surely <laughs> are they that poor? You know sort of uh, scoffing at the whole uh, poverty industry. For some reason, I thought about it and I was like, you know, this boy has to remove the flies from the dead body. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Ooh, that, I, I have to say that is brilliant, Doreen. That is brilliant. Yeah. That is brilliant. Yeah. Um, but yeah. thank you both so much for, um, you and, know, Obviously, coming to hang out with us at the Cheeky Natives, as we you can tell, we really had a wonderful time reading your stories. Um, we wish you the best for the award ceremony, but not only for that, for your writing careers. I think that um, this is the beginning of great things for both of you. And um, I, I mean, I think I speak for both Alma and I when I say we kind of want to have dibs on this novel. So if it comes out mm -hmm. and you discussions, like you know where to find us. Um, yeah. Okay. We are really about just elevating black writers on the continent, yeah. the diaspora, just thinking about black people, writing about black people for black people. So thank you for uh, the ways in which you show up in the world. Um, and thank you for your short stories. Yeah, so I think much. just from, from, from us, thank you so much to both of you. I think, um, you know, so much of, of what you I think in, in, in just literature, we feel almost like people don't necessarily always appreciate. But I think just from the comments that you've seen uh, around your story today, there's just been something so powerful for your readers to see so much of themselves and their experiences um, being written about. And I, I think it's beautiful. So congratulations to both of you. We wish you the best of luck um, ahead of, of the, the ceremony. But we also know that this is really just the beginning of, of some amazing things and we can't wait to see what's next in store for, for you both. So congratulations and thank you once again and we really look forward to hosting you and your novels, both of you, uh, at some point again on the Cheeky Nances. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And to everyone who's to everyone who's joined us, thank you also so much for um, joining us on this Thursday evening uh, or Thursday afternoon, wherever you may be in the world, or Thursday morning. We really appreciate it. Um, and, yeah, 
uh, once again to Doreen and Irene. All the best and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.